I would assume that most of the folks in this room are non MDs. They're not physicians. They're not DOs. So our work is to obviously to help them. We heard a lot this morning from, in terms of what kind of the clinical examination that needs to take place and some of the training and, and obviously from the medical profession, but what we're going to be focusing on now kind of is more for those of us that are come at this from a, a, a more support position than necessarily the, the MD or the physician, the medical side of things. And then also questioning what new tools and innovation and advances that we might be able to, to uh, take advantage of, including narrative that we heard about last night and using books to help deepen the conversations, and also then from, from Helen's own um, learning that she's had with, with her experiences. So quickly, let's do a, a quick review of kind of advanced care planning and, and trying to determine whether or not this idea that we had a long, long time ago that this was going to help us with patients and families, uh, has, how has it played out? So since the mid-70s, the advanced directives in general are, have been promoted as the primary legal tool that we've all used to advance our discussions. We've kind of, we've, we've adopted laws in this country that say people should have the opportunity to do this and in a sense kind of have an obligation to do it so that they name an agent, they tell us what they want, and in fact we have this checklist as we talked about today that says these are the boxes that I want in terms of the kind of care I receive, and these are the kind of things. So we, we talk about those as kind of the two sides of an advanced care planning, advanced directive document, the naming of your agent and the, and the, the, the health care directive, which really talks about what we want. We also, in the, um, I guess it was in 1990, had the Patient Self-Determination Act. And that kind of involved then the medical system in helping us support that effort uh, more, more realistically. And that really grew out of the Nancy Cruzan case when we finally went to the Supreme Court and we said, do we have a constitutional right for us to be able to refuse treatment? The answer to that was yes, but obviously the states can impose certain limits to, to being able to make those choices. So here we have to do is provide you know, clear and convincing evidence or whatever it was, uh, certainly in the state of Missouri. But that kind of helped layer on an additional layer onto the legal way that we look at this thing, is that there's these laws now that govern how we as consumers need to make our and express our wishes and have them made known. And it kind of put us in a, in a box that made this more of a legalistic kind of transaction that we have with the healthcare system and with our physicians, rather than what we've been talking about last night and today in a more conversational and communication style. It really kind of put us into that. And, and the center was at, at, the, at the center of that discussion, had, believing that in many cases, promoting advanced care planning, certainly advanced directives, was going to help us have those conversations in a more formal, you know, maybe technically prompted way to say, hey, this is good for us. We need to be doing this. But then it kind of put us in a box and, and forced us into saying, okay, now we've got these laws that govern this, and how do we make sure that we make the protections uh, affordable to everybody? Are we moving? No, we're not moving. Thank you. I'm doing this backwards, sorry. I guess I was fine. So the Uniform Healthcare Decisions Act came about in 1994, and that was basically the, the American Bar Association said, okay, let's take these laws, let's put them together, let's figure out how we can do this better than what we've been doing in the past. So all the state's laws that had been adopted in the area of, of uh, living will statutes and, and all the laws that came after that in the 80s and 90s around um, naming an agent, the American Bar Association, the Commission on Law and Aging got together and said, you know, we really need to come up with a uniform code. We need to come up with a way to be able to do this meaningfully for people, kind of lessening these, all these, sim these uh, kind of challenges that we had about having to do it this way or having to do it that way and having to have it witnessed and having to have it notarized and let's come up with a better way to do this and let's let's create a uniform code that we can do it well all it really became was an idea for states to to con contemplate um, and as it might be for most of us the states of kansas and missouri pretty much said nah not so much for us we're gonna we're gonna stay with what we got so we've never been able to really adopt the uniform code, but it has been out there and promoted by the American Bar Association since 94 as a way for states to kind of lessen some of the legal aspects of this and make it a more social experience for, for patients and families. So the uptakes on advanced directives originally 
was promising. Uh, when they first came on in the 70s and 80s, about 15% of us, kind of the early adopters, chimed in and said, yeah, that's for me. I want to do that, and it's important, and we should do it. But then we kind of got stuck there. We got stuck there for a long time, and we really never got over about 30%. It bumped up to 30% in the mid to early 2000s, but that was mainly because we were doing a much better job of dealing with people who were in long-term care. So their actual percentages were about 50% of people in long-term care were doing it. But the rest of us were still pretty miserable in terms of being able to, to sign our documents, at least in the appointment of our agents and the healthcare directives. And the healthcare directives were really, this is the, the living will side, were really kind of abysmal in terms of the statistics. And that's not such a bad thing because it actually says, these are the things that I actually want and these are the things that I don't, and most of us don't know that. But what we also found was that we weren't very good at having conversations about our values and our preferences with our loved ones, which were very, very important, obviously, in us naming our agent. So in the late 2000s, Congress commissioned a report on advanced care planning. And Myra and I were lucky enough to be asked to, to participate in that uh, document, the creation of that document. There were a variety of different people that were invited to that discussion. Uh, Charlie Sabatino, who most of us know and love, at the Commission on Law and Aging, wrote the legal parts of that. Myra and I were, were co-authored, helped co-author the section on, it, on engagement and how do we have more public discussions about the importance of the need for this. But it really focused on the fact that we need to broaden this idea of advanced directives and begin to have advanced care planning as the focus of our work. Get out of this thing about it has to be a legal document, it has to be notarized and witnessed. And let's have a discussion about the kinds of conversations we should be having. So it really helped us expand that discussion and really cautioned us in this thing to say we don't need to make this any more legal. In fact, the report to Congress talks about acknowledging the shortfalls that we've experienced for the first 20 years of this. And it said we, it called for abandoning and, and not having this legal transactional approach. And this is Charlie. Charlie wrote this section. And he's, this guy's Commission on Law and Aging, a lawyer to the core. And he's the one that's saying, this hasn't benefited the American public in the way that we thought it was going to. What we need to do is have a more consumer-based approach that invites conversation, gets families into situations where they can have these conversations in an open way and be creative about the tools. So some of the things that we're going to we'll share with you are really kind of what's happened as a result of that since 2010. So just to kind of finalize on the report to Congress, what we really confirmed was that too few people were making, you know, these legal documents. They weren't using them. And when they did, they were confusing. They didn't know what they were for. They didn't understand them particularly well, especially those who had language barriers and came from particular ethnic groups. They, it just was not a good tool for them at all. Some of us that had, you know, traditional access to health care all our lives and were very comfortable, had a nice relationship with our physician that was 20 years, you know, in the making, and we had that opportunity to do it. We were, we were okay with doing it, but a lot of other people were really left out of this, and that was an acknowledgement that came out of this. The other thing is that the forms themselves don't really provide any guidance. I mean, the center's work in caring conversations is one of the few resources where there's really any kind of content around the discussion or instruction around how do you name an agent and what's the role of that agent and why is it important for them to understand their fiduciary obligation, which is, again, a legal term that, that well, certainly a technical term that most people don't get. But we were saying, when you have this discussion with this person, they need to understand that their first obligation is to follow your instruction, not to do what they think they would do for themselves. And, to, and there really wasn't a whole lot of good content that was out there for people. We we're just kind of leaving people up to their own devices, and it wasn't necessarily very helpful for them. The other thing was we, we started recognizing that patients' goals change over time. And I think Martha mentioned earlier today, what we were not very good at recognizing was not necessarily their values were shifting, but their goals were changing. Somebody recently talked to me, and it's one of the ideas that we're going to be talking about in terms of research that needs to be done in, um, in the work of um, effective forecasting and prospect theory. Is we were, I was talking to her on the phone one day about her work in prospect theory, which is basically how do you pros prospectively look at yourself in some future point in life and assess whether or not your willingness to take a risk on the things that you're looking at right now are going to be the same 15 years from now. 
So we all have this notion that, you know, we all say at 50, you know, oh my God, that, that, that's a life not worth living. That, that would be intolerable to me. And then you hit 70 and you're there and you get the diagnosis and it's like, ah, it doesn't look so bad. I mean, maybe, maybe we can accommodate that. And I was, I was trying to clarify with her what her work was doing in prospect theory in terms of that, that looking forward. And I said, well, it sounds to me like what you're talking about is that you're moving the goalposts. The goalposts are here, and then all of a sudden you move them over here. And she said, no, John, I think you've got it wrong. She said, I'm not talking about moving the goalposts. I'm not talking about the foundational values of the person changing. Independence, quality of life are still very, very important to me. I'm talking about you're moving the uprights. That foundational feeling for that person is still there, but the, the goalposts are going like this, because now that condition, that chronic disease, is saying this is, these are the limits that we're now going to be facing in your life, and before you always looked at them as being out here, but that doesn't mean that independence and quality of life has shifted. I mean, my mom still has her keys, unfortunately, but we're working on that, but but being able to get in the car and go where she wants to go in the middle of the day, as long as she only does right turns, is still a big deal to her. And she wants to do that. But we've said to her, Mom, you know, you haven't driven anywhere in the last four months. All your grandkids and everybody else takes you. And I said, you know, you're paying more in car insurance than my wife and I pay for two vehicles in Kansas City. And you're in Wichita. And I said, you know, that... $1,500 a year that you're spending in car insurance for your car to sit in the garage doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you're on a fixed income. And she goes, yeah, but it's, it just makes me know that I don't have to depend on the girls if I need to go somewhere. And I said, okay, I get it. I get it. And I'm trying to filter myself. But anyway, back to, back to, <laughs> back to the point is that the goalpost hasn't shifted, but the uprights have changed. And so she's, there's, there's some research that she's doing in that area that I think we really, we, we really haven't paid a lot of attention to. Because this is, back to Martha's point, most of the research that we look at in the medical field is these double-blinded clinical trials, and we're not looking to social, social uh, psychology, or in, this actually comes from uh, economic theory, on terms of how people take risks. How do they, how do they posit risk in terms of the, the right now and in the future? in terms of looking at gambling and looking at, you know, those kind of things. So there's a lot of that could conform the science that we have yet to develop. The ACA kind of sidetracked us uh, in 9 and 10. This is right after the report came out. Um, and the whole, you know, mumble jumbo with, with uh, death panels and stuff. So, but I, I don't think that was ever seriously considered by the American public as to be, it was, it was basically became kind of the hot button of the, of the, of the day. And we, we had to work through it and get, get over it, and we did. So in, in 2010, 2011, we started rethinking it again. And that's when, 2012, the American Bar Association came out again with a report. They had a resolution that said, you know, we need to be thinking about these other mechanisms and tools and opportunities for people to have these social conversations, and we need to adopt them and integrate them into the, the Affordable Care Act. One of the suggestions they made was in the welcome to Medicare visit that the doctors have a conversation with their patients about advanced care planning. All right, that's 2012. It picked up a lot of steam in 2013 and then in 2014. And, you know, the, the, the fading of the ACA debacle was kind of happening to us. And now in 2014, the IOM report comes out and said, okay, we need to do something about this. We actually need to start integrating this into practice. And practice of physicians with their patients and patient and social uh, experiences for the patients themselves. So since 2014, I'm just going to go very quickly through now, since 2014 there has been an absolute explosion of all kinds of things in the social experience of Americans. And I think you know, this is the comment I made last night at the dinner about, you know, we've waited 30 years for advanced care planning, you know, those of us that have been plowing this field for a long, long time, for it really kind of take the imagination of the American people and do something with it. So uh, these are just some examples um, as that I've just picked up on just in the last couple of years. When Breath Becomes Air is the new book by Paul Kalanithi and his, and his wife Lucy that just came out that's taken kind of New York uh, Times by storm. Consider the Conversation is the second in a series of videos that's been out just since 2012 which is, they're, they're available online, deep conversations with families. We did a whole series with KPTS, uh, excuse me, is it, yes, KPTS here in Kansas City on that. The patient, 
a surgeon, the surgeon's journey is um, Jeff Peeler. Thank you. Jeff Peeler's story as a um, cardiac thoracic surgeon at KU that basically tells his story of his own diagnosis with prostate cancer. And they're now in the process of getting it um, out and putting curriculum around it through KU and hopefully some other medical schools in the near future. The Conversation Project, we had Ellen um, Goodman a few years ago at the center. They were just, they were just taking off. And now they kind of integrated their work with the Institute for Health Improvement. The Coalition for Compassionate Care in California, which got a $4 million grant over the, the, the course of the, the last five years or so to adopt Polst and to begin all kinds of expanded efforts with, with community conversations in the state of California. Uh, the, um, what is that, HealthWise or DeathWise? DeathWise, which is a, a new website for people to go to, not-for-profit group that's trying to help engage other uh, folks in conversations, basically on and online. Angelo Valendez's new book on the conversation and his work with physicians that he's doing primarily helping physicians gain competencies and skills in this area. This New York Times piece, um, this is by Lucy Kalanithi after her husband died, but I wanted to, I think the next slide is, uh, no, these are, I'm sorry, these are three others. These, the, the death over dinner movement some of you may have heard about that. Death Cafe, which we featured in the series that we did here. Death Cafe is um, activities of people just gathering at coffee houses and starting talking about, there's no design curriculum, there's no, people just come and start talking about death. The Wake Up to Dying Project, which is a traveling show of um, kind of interactive and um, multimedia experiences where people go in and view art and view music and hear podcasts and then share in a community setting, in a park setting, their experiences. It's usually done around a fair and they're in the process of uh, doing that all over the East Coast now. Common Practice, which is a, a basically a uh, outgrowth of the, the Action Mill, which is a, a program really designed around um, helping families have more uh, discussions using games. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute, but it actually goes beyond just the game part of it. These are two of the games that have come out. The, this is the first one, My Gift of Grace, which is the Action Mill, uh, which is also part of Common Practice, which is a series of cards that you use and engage around a conversation with family and friends in a social setting. They actually do them in malls in uh, Philadelphia where they bring together people and share these game, this game part. And then you have little blue chips that you play when you're, when you're really connected with somebody else on their story and saying thank you for sharing that. And it has a, a whole kind of social context that goes with it. That's, through, that's from Common Practice. This one's been around a little bit longer. The Code Alliances Go Wish card game. Uh, I did this recently at a board meeting uh, that I, a family foundation board that I joined. You get a series of 20, I think it's 20, maybe 30 cards, and you prioritize these different issues about what's most important to you at the end of life. And you're, you're basically forced to come up with five of them that are most important to you and then share those with the person that's sitting across from you. Hopefully that will be your agent. But it kind of gets away from this notion about sitting down and kind of going through the, the health care directive, you know, point by point by point. It's supposed to be more interactive and really helps with an understanding for the person because because they're going through the same card deck, and they've got 25, 30 cards that they go through, and it's amazing, you'll, you'll find as you go through it, it's amazing what five pop up for you and what five pop up for them. The, the group that I was in, two, there were three of us in the group, both of my partners had pain, being free from pain, as the primary, one of their five, and it was not even on my list. And I said, we were in the discussion afterwards, I said, why is this so important to you guys? And one of them lives with chronic pain. And he said, that will be, when, when I die, that will be the greatest relief that I experience. Because he said, I, I live with it every day of my life. And he said, it is debilitating at times, just debilitating. And he said, that's what I hold on to. So if, if there's anything that I can look forward to in the final days of my life, it would be to live without pain. And this, this is a guy refused to take medications to, to do it. He was trying to do it through therapies and everything else. The other woman had had two serious pain episodes where she said it was so excruciating, even though it was for short term, I was following illnesses. Uh, she said, I, I, I cannot think about that again in my life. So she said, if there's anything that I would want. 
for me, I live basically my life pretty much without pain. I get a headache once in a while. I take a couple of ibuprofen, and I'm usually pretty good. Thank God that that's been my experience. But it didn't even occur to me that pain would be one of them. So here, I want to hope this act. Can you activate that link and see if it comes up? This is, this is just an example in terms of writing literature in the arts. Will it work? I hope it does. I want to I give you an example of just, this is just the New York Times, all right? In the last few years, on articles on death and dying. So scroll down. I think you'll probably hit a block at, at within the first five or six or so, and they'll say, show more. Yeah, go back to the, crawl, crawl back up a little bit. Okay, then hit more. Show some more. Does it say show more? All right, now, continue to scroll. This just keeps populating and populating. And po Watch for the, the little uh, the icons on the right where there's a, a snuffed-out candle. hope this works. The, this is a series that the New York Times has done. It's not loading fast enough, probably. No, I'm sorry. Okay, well, it's not, it's not going to show for you guys. Anyway, since 2014, they have had over 150 articles. And so I let it finally fully load all the way down. When you get beyond 2014, it drops to like 20. And back to, to, I think, 1997, 1998, where they first started categorizing them, it goes to like seven. 150 in the last year. And then there's a series of this snuffed out candle, where if you load it, if you go to this thing, and just, just Google on death and dying in New York Times, there's like 35 articles since 2014. 35 in this series of articles where they've invited people across the country to talk about these issues. All of them personal stories, personal experiences of their own family situations or things that they have found to be helpful in their, in their journey at the end of life. So there's just this explosion. Um, is Deborah Karcher still here? There she is. Um, the Final Acts Project, the work that they're working on with their first acts writing program and their time capsule. I, I invite you to visit with her. It's exciting new work that they're, being, they're, they're doing. And you guys are in Texas, but really all over or still in Texas right now? Using art and, and theater, actually, right? And theater. And, but engaging people in conversations prior to the, the experience. So. Can, can you hear her? The, the parties that you hosted? The... Can, can somebody get her a mic? There you go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yes, we also have bucket list parties, and they have turned out to be among our most popular um, programs. Uh, people gather um, in groups of five to 60, and they basically talk about their top three to five wishes. And that generates a conversation around planning and you know what they hope to do. Uh, we really encourage in our narrative for people to be the author of their life script. And that's what I think people forget about, is that they have the power to author their own life. Nice story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, but we also use theater. Uh, we do humanities programming, and um, we do artistic programming. And it seems to soften this conversation enough for people to participate in it. So, yeah, we're based in Texas and Austin, but we're working statewide and actually moving into a few other states. Thank you. Um, also, the, right now, uh, the Hospice Foundation of America is taking the Atul Gawande um, video that was um, on, um, what is it? Yeah, Frontline, the Frontline piece that he did, and hosting community engagements uh, activities all across the country. You can sign up now. Hospice Foundation of America is signing up communities all over the place to take the video that he did, not just the book, but the video, uh, and watching it and then having community conversations. As well. That was actually funded. The, the video itself, the Frontline video, was funded by John Awana Harmon Foundation, and they also then have, are now funding the Hospice Foundation of America on their projects to take this out and, and do more, more into the community and hosting these, these engagement projects. Now here's some others that are going around uh, that are uh, offered for 
Most of these are for professional training, but also community engagement. The Honoring Your Wishes in Iowa City, Iowa is a community-wide project. I think that's actually sponsored by a hospice program, as is the one in the lower right, which is Conversations of a Lifetime, uh, which is a $2 million grant that a foundation, or excuse me, a hospice program received up there to do a dual effort, not only with engaging the community, and you can see their different resources there, but then doing a whole series of educational activities with physicians, uh, actually funding the project to the point where they actually pay physicians to come and sit through the training program so that they can become more adept at being able to do that. I don't we all wish we'd be able to, to finance that. But anyway, and then Gunderson Lutherans, obviously their work that they've been doing uh, in hospital systems across the country for many years. So even in engaging diverse populations, we've, we've um, kind of started ta tackling that. The Prepare for Your Care is uh, out of UCSF, um, and uh, the work that they're doing, when you cl actually click on that, it starts off interactive from the get-go and is in both English and in Spanish, and it's basically to engage the folks in the San Francisco area, minority populations, in helping them understand the importance of sharing the conversation. But again, focusing more on the social interaction than on the actual legal documents that need to be prepared and helping them understand and, and really appreciate the fact that they need to be ready to answer questions of healthcare professionals in Western medicine when they go in there. And we need to have a, a more robust conversation so we don't end up like um, Daniel's family did. In, in the hospital setting. The bottom right is the certificate that we're offering the, the folks that we're training in the African American Project uh, to advance, advance care planning among faith communities. It's an effort that we're doing in six cities across the United States. There'll be one here in Kansas City and, and our work will be to help collect and analyze kind of what are the, what, what's working, what's not working within faith communities and helping them reach out. These are primarily African American communities and helping them out, outreach to their congregants and their parishioners to help them do a better job of having these conversations. So that effort is in the kind of the full throes right now. We're hoping to be able to have that wrapped up within the next six to nine months and we'll be doing a report on that and hopefully be able to, to move it forward. The idea of ethical wills is another area that uh, we've had. There's been some, probably not as much uptake on that, but uh, these are two efforts that are going on right now. One sponsored by the Personal Legacy Advisors, and I believe uh, this is a proprietary effort, but it's, uh, it has been engaging most people through kind of, first of all, engaging them in the legal transactional process in terms of not the legal transactional process of doing advanced care planning documents, but kind of preparing for their wills and estates. And then saying to them, in order for you to really capture who you are as a person, we'd like for you to consider writing an ethical will, which is much different than a, a regular will. It talks about, the, again, the, the things that are important to us, love and legacy and, and handing things on in terms of values and those kind of things, but writing a letter basically to your family. There's also a Jewish one called So That Your val Values Live On, Ethical Wills and How to Prepare Them. That's been uh, sponsored by the, um, a, a number of synagogues in terms of life letters and those kind of things. Again, more in physician training. Um, this is um, Vital Talk, which is uh, an online program sponsored by physicians for physicians to help them improve their ability to do this. This is uh, Dr. Bob Arnold, who is uh, at a Pitt, who's a UMKC grad, I believe, medical school grad. And he's one of the sponsors of this, and they use a variety of different physicians to train physicians on how to have these conversations online and, and go through the process of, of learning that themselves. There's also um, a number of series that have been taking place on public radio. This is one sponsored by WHYY in Boston uh, by our own Alana Gordon, who was here at KCUR before she went up there on a series of um, looking at an organization that's connected actually to health plans in outreach by um, case managers to talk to people with advanced chronic illness about what their goals of care are. So uh, it's a little bit um, on the edge. There's been some accusations that this is a way for health plans to limit care, but I think uh, the effort that they're doing, I think Rich actually serves on their advisory committee. Um, and has been, the, the actual, the, the group has done a really good job of making sure that the case managers who call out are actually talking to people and then allowing the people to state what their goals of care are and what, what their expectations are in terms of the advance of their normal course of illness. Uh, online advanced care planning tools, uh, Penn State has one um, that's called Plan for Your Future, 
which is totally online. It's, um, it's not for the faint of heart, I will tell you that. It took me, I think, a couple hours to get through. Um, but it is very thorough and very evidence-based uh, and steeped in research. Um, um, Michael Green and um, Levi, um, Benjamin Levi are the two primary researchers that have really uh, started this effort. Um, so I, I invite you to take a look at it, but it, I think it, it really is more, I, when you agree, Meyer, more for an educated population. Um, then NH, the National Healthcare Decisions Day has a series of resources for advanced care planning also online for people to take a look at. And um, the NHDD is, has been doing a, a lot of the collection of that over the course of the last few, few years. So why, but we also still have a lot of learning, and these are the ones I wanted to talk to you about. These are, these are the social science research activities that really haven't caught the attention of the medical field yet in terms of what they're learning about what we should be looking at in terms of how people actually make decisions and people how, how reluctant or, or inclined people are to have families. Uh, a lot of work in affective forecasting, which is again kind of this, how do I see myself emotionally tied to these, these decisions and, and opportunities that exist for me in the future. Relational coordination, which is a lot of the work that uh, they're doing on the game theory stuff that uh, Action Mill and, and Common Practice are doing. Prospect theory I talked about. Transformative learning, which is how is it that we learn when a single episode happens to us and completely transforms the way that we look at life. So that can happen. Not to everybody, but in some cases it may be a cancer diagnosis, a, a life event, a big event that somehow changes the outlook that you have at life in general. Um, and that actually may, there's, there's some research indicating there that that actually does change value systems, that people fundamentally look at life differently after that kind of event. Uh, utility assessment by Dwayne Stewart out of Texas. And response shift theory, and response shift theory is, is more, inclined, more like uh, transformative learning. It's basically how do I, after I have a, a huge event that hits me, how does my response change in terms of the shift that my, my view of life has shifted dramatically? So how is it that I then relate to my loved ones and family differently? But these are, these are all areas of research that we've really not explored in, in, the, in the medical realm in terms of how it is that we make decisions, and especially when we're affected by end-of-life uh, questions and, and, and illnesses.